Hi everyone, it's showtime. Well, thanks for joining me. Let me adjust my camera. My camera is not used to making me do this show at this hour, so my face is a little dark, but I will figure that out while you guys are watching my intro. How is this? Is this better? That. All right. Perfect. So, hi everyone. Thanks for joining me again. Uh, this is a live show, different format, and just like last couple of weeks, we are going to be getting questions from you. So please don't hesitate asking your questions. We have a good, very special guest, uh, one of my favorite people in the whole industry, straight shooter, uh, good salesman, but also a good guy to you know spend time enjoying. I think I have been his customer for about maybe 10 years or so. And so many times he has pulled miracles for me. So we will talk about that, but we will talk about many other things. I would like to introduce Joe from Windstream. Hi, Joe. Thanks for joining me today. How are you? I'm doing well, Mehmet. Thank you. Thanks for the kind intro. I appreciate it. Do you remember the very first time we did a business where I needed you to do some miracle work? I do. I, I remember a couple of conversations, but the first one wasn't wasn't the easiest conversation, but we got through it very, very quickly. You know, it is very important to get to know someone that way. And then many, many years after that, you know, you're able to stand up and just watch for them and win stream. You know, I have been working for many years in different companies, Yahoo, Microsoft, etc. You know, different companies I've been part of. You know, I, I've been impressed with the speed of delivery and especially you being there. So I want to thank again, but hey, let's move right in. Thanks for everyone joining us. Again, the questions, you can comment uh, and ask your questions on YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, Joe, how are you? First of all, let's start with that. You are a New Yorker, correct? And I want to ask you, how, how have you been doing? How is your team doing? I, I know a lot of people from your team as well. I visited your office, as you remember, two, I guess two years ago. Yes. Um, the one, the one in New York, in New York yes, City. Yeah. Yes, yes, really enjoyed it as well. How are you guys doing with this pandemic? Well, so I, I live in New York, right? So I, I live uh, specifically on Long Island, which is about 15 miles outside of New York City. Um, so this area has been impacted greatly, um, you know, but I think just like any type of um, situation that's an emergency, you know, New Yorkers figure out a way to get through it. And uh, it was very rocky early on. Um, obviously, there was it was the hot spot of the country, hot spot of the world, very quickly. And I think you know, you just like just like anything, I, I really do think like 9/11, which is very different than this, but but New Yorkers typically uh, figure out a way to get through it, and they and they do get through it. And um, you know, I think New Yorkers we follow the rules, and as you can tell right now, um, you know the numbers in New York, you know, have certainly been going down. So that's a very, very good sign in the New York for the entire New York metro area. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I'm I'm glad that you're safe, and I hope that you know uh, everybody that you know is safe. There are a lot of people passed away. It's really sad, uh, yep. but I think you know, as you just mentioned, New Yorkers are very disciplined people, you know, and they know how to manage these kind of crises. Um, yep. I want to dive right in. Uh, we have a lot of people watching us right now, and uh, this is going to just continue growing, and we are going to receive questions. Uh, we like to give priority to the questions from people, but in the meantime, I have some questions for you. Sure. I would like to start with, <laughs> I think, the, the, what it, the elephant in the room. <laughs> you know, everybody yeah. is wondering about the Chapter 11. So uh, I am one of those, you know, customers, your current customer as well, that, you know, when chapter 11 thing came out, I was like, read it. Okay, never mind. Windstream is has services all around the nation, provides critical services. It's not like they're going anywhere. I want to hear from you. I think a lot of people who's watching us and then people who will watch us later want to hear from you. Tell us about this chapter 11. What's the latest on it? Does that impact your business at all? Yeah. So let, let's take a step back, big step back to uh, February of 2019. 
Uh, we lost a, uh, a court case with a company called Aurelius Capital, which is a firm that's located here in New York. Uh, they had sued us over the uh, spinoff um, and some of the bond covenants in, um, uh, in, in our bond agreement over the spinoff of, at the time, which was CS, CSNL uh, slash now Unity. Um, so uh, we lost that court case in February. A few days after that, we wind up filing for Chapter 11. Um, and uh, it was pretty shocking, I think, to, to a lot of us on this end. I, I would tell you that, you know, we thought we were going to win the case. Um, but, but you know, as court cases go, you never know, right? That's why when you go to court, you, you try not to go to court if you're not sure, because you just never know what happens in the court. Absolutely. So, uh, so that was February of last year. Um, you know, you, you fast forward to where we are now. A lot has happened in the world. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, outside of the pandemic, we've we've been able to um, to recapitalize the company. So all the creditors um, at, at the company, which, you know, as, as in, a, in any, most bankruptcies, you convert your debt to, to equity. And those were going to be owned by a, uh, a number of um, what I would call private equity firms, the largest being Elliott, Ca uh, Elliott Management. They'll, uh, they'll be our biggest stakeholder. We will be a privately held company. That's very different. So that's that's going to be different than in the past. Um, but once we restructured uh, the the uh, the debt to equity, we also uh, I think back in April we uh, came to an agreement with Unity. Uh, so we have a settlement with Unity, which is a big part of our restructuring. And Unity will be a big big partner for us moving forward. Not only a business partner, but a strategic partner in a lot of things we do. Uh, we're going to be you know they're going to buy a lot of our fiber. We're going to provide some services on the back end. So we will be a big partner with Unity moving forward. That all said, the, the next critical date on, on the restructuring is coming up uh, in a couple of days, uh, June 24th. That's going to be where we have our confirmation hearing and we present the restructuring, pl uh, call it restructuring plan or the restructuring proposal. Uh, we think that will go fine. Um, and if, if that goes fine, then we probably should emerge that the, the target month would be August. So you're talking about August, another few months from now, Windstream will be out of bankruptcy and a private company owned by uh, by by a number of of new uh, partners, and the bulk of which will be private equity firms. Well, I am one of those customers who have seen before and uh, during this, uh, you know, Chapter Eleven, and I I don't see any slowdown in the service activations or anything like that. And do you think that? Uh, so I I want to kind of uh, relate that question to now pandemic days. Did yeah. you guys experience any kind of service issues, you know, ability to restore services faster or was everything operating normally? Yeah. So you take a look at Windstream, right? We have three lines of businesses, right? We have a consumer business, we have an enterprise business, and we have my business, which is the wholesale. The consumer business and all these service businesses have been fortunate, right? Because there's been a there's a demand for the service, right? It's unlike the airlines, unlike a restaurant where people just stop using it. People started moving, you know, from from the work environment to the home, um, and and these corporate customers and the, the the large networks needed larger networks to accommodate people from working home. So our consumer business has we, we've benefited with net ads, you know, just flat out customers, more customers needing uh, broadband services to the home and increased speeds, right? So that's a good thing. From an enterprise standpoint, uh, you know, it's a little tricky uh, with 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 uh, the pandemic pandemic because you know a lot of businesses were closed um, so you're not necessarily being able to install services but at the same time we have a um, office suite technology which came to us by way of Broadview if you remember a few years ago we acquired Broadview mm -hmm. we have wonderful uh, video conferencing capability that's built on the Zoom platform but that's in high demand uh, even though some of the businesses were closed uh, some businesses were forced to, to implement as you know video conferencing technology I mean you and I have probably been using it for years but there's other companies that have just started. Absolutely. And then you have our wholesale business, right? So our wholesale business, we saw a bit, bit of a spike, which is good uh, in um, in the in the broadband, uh, just just flat out core transport services. We saw uh, an increase in you know demand for uh, some IP services. And when I say services, meaning in, in, in addition to the towers, the, we do a lot of fiber to the towers, those are more increasing upgrades in speed. So you saw some new and also some increases in speeds. But you did mention, you know, some side effects, right? Because no one, no one's immune from what's going on. And what we, learned early, what we learned early on, there were two things um, that were that started to Im impact our ability to turn up service for some customers, not all. And we started to navigate through it very, very quickly. But the 
you know, the equipment manufacturers, uh, obviously, uh, you know, a lot of the components of the, 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 the equipment that we all use to turn up service, uh, a lot of those components are made in different parts of the world and some of those factories were shut down. So we did see a, a increase in delivery times of how long it, take, it took to get a piece of equipment shipped and in sight. So that did impact us. And we worked with, you know, we're big partners with Infinair and Siena. Those are our two big equipment providers. We did work with them early enough to try to navigate through some of the issues. And, you know, the, the, the dates that you get equipment instead of two weeks, maybe it took four weeks. So there was certainly some impacts. And then the other impact was obviously getting technicians to sites, that, that there was an impact there. Some technicians couldn't get into a site. Some sites were closed. If someone had came down with, uh, you know, uh, COVID-19, the sites were closed for a few days or whatever the, the rules were in each city. So we did have some um, some restrictions in terms of techs getting into sites. But overall, I think we managed through it. We're still managing through it. It's not over yet, right? We're just coming through a different phase. Joe, uh, one of the questions I want to ask you is, I mean, you're a, an executive who's involved in so many planning. Have you guys ever envisioned such pandemic that impact nationwide, almost all the locations where you have operations and kind of create like a lockdown, both for you, your teams, but at the same time, you know, for your customers may, and maybe your partners that you work with. What kind of, you know, suggestions you have for anyone that is planning for the next kind of big thing that we never thought about? Could you tell me a little bit about your, about the disaster recovery part of the business? Yeah. So good question. And, and I, you know, I, 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 I joke about this sometimes with people because, you know, we're in the business and you do a lot of reading, you know, the only one that I know that was planning or forecasting that this could possibly happen was Bill Gates. He was really the only one out there saying, Hey, this is going to happen. Um, and, and, you know, quite frankly, he was right. I, I think from, from, you know, what you learned, what, what I can say, what I learned very quickly um, is is we have a business continuity group inside the company that I quite frankly didn't even know what they did, but early on, early on in in, in February they were very active um, and they led us through the early stage of this thing and they led my CEO who's done a great job of communicating this throughout our company and leading us through this effort um, very early, early like you know right at the start of it and maybe at the end of February early March when they realized that this was going to be really something different than we've ever experienced. Um, so, so I would tell you, from Windstream standpoint, we're probably a little bit more prepared than most. A lot of our employees um, were working from home already. So my team, which is really sales, marketing, business development, network planning, a lot of them already work from home. Um, or if they didn't, th they were able to work from home by pulling a laptop with them. Um, the others, we move very quickly. So stuff, folks in the Knox, folks in some of the inside call centers, we were able to move them, get laptops de deployed, and get them to move. You know, so lesson learned, I think, is you have to be, you have to be, um, you certainly have to be flexible. And I, I, I could tell you in talking to some friends, um, uh, you know, over the last few weekends, uh, um, I, I'm, I'm surprised to hear how much everyone loves working from home and how productive they think they are. Because I've been saying it for years and people used to laugh at me. Um, but but it, it forced those companies that never really uh, tinkered with working from home they forced those companies quickly to move to the to the work at home environment. And I think that testing, although they were forced to do it, I think they realized that in some cases it works. And I, I would tell you the out, outcome of this is you'll probably see a lot more folks working from home or at least a portion of their time. Absolutely. And one of the things, uh, you know, I personally was against, you know, I have, I'm running besides this show and if repeating, I'm running a company across Latin America. So we were like always saying, Hey, you have to work from office, but I, I'm like, no, no, no. That two hour, three hour every day you waste in traffic and, you know, in transportation, you are putting back to work. I'm so happy. And actually I hear that from everybody that I have hosted so far, they are saying the same thing. Of course, this is going to provide probably create a big impact on the real estate side of things, but uh, yeah. I guess that's out of our scope for today. So yeah. uh, I want to I want to dive right in. Um, you are one of the faces that you know are in every big conference. You know, representing Windstream really well, re representing our industry and also some other conferences really well. And when was the last time you traveled? So I had a so the. So I had a an, uh, an executive staff meeting in New York City the week the last week in February. 
um, and, and I'm happy to report because I had my entire team in all my, you know, the, the senior folks on our team, about 20 people in New York City. Uh, I think that, so I went down to Metro Connect. Um, what was that? The, the 13th, the 14th, the 15th of February, I forget. And then I flew out to Seattle from Miami. And then I came back uh, to New York and we had, we all met in New York. So the last time I traveled was, um, was probably mid, uh, late February. But I'm happy to report everyone I had at my staff meeting in New York got out and we were all over. We were in restaurants. We were, we saw some plays. We went to down in the village. We were, you know, uh, staying out late. We rode the subways. No one was infected. So I'm happy to report that. But that was the last time that I traveled for business. Late what, about, February. what about conferences? When do you think you will be able to travel back to conferences if they are ever hosted again? Yeah. Well, first of all, let me say this. They absolutely will be conferences back. There's no question in my mind. I, you know, so I, I participated in Nanog in little, you know, two weeks ago and a little bit of, of ITW last week. It's just not the same doing it online. There's things that you can do online that we're collaborating and we'll hear about things and we'll we'll socialize some ideas and some concepts. But the value in these concept in, in these conferences is the face-to-face -face interaction that you see with clients and industry executives and the meal that you have with them, the face-to-face -face meeting. That's not going away. When it comes back. I would suggest, and this is this is all. No one knows the answer. I would say maybe PTC, but but you know who knows? Who knows what happens between now and and you know December? But I think they're definitely going to come back. I, I would not. They're going to come back. I think I think people realize the value of them, um, and people miss them. You talk to people. I miss them. I don't miss necessarily the business travel constantly, but so it's been nice to have this break. But but I but I also think that the conferences are necessary and a big piece of what we do. Absolutely, I I travel quite a bit for conferences as well, and I agree with you. I miss the side of you know knowledge that you can gather by yes. talking to people, and you know, okay, we are planning this because not everything is about press release. Not everything is about just making a video and talking about it. It's about maybe years of discussions behind. Hey, can yeah. we do this? And pick people's brains it's literally a little bit hard you know to do that right now so i yeah, have you, know, you know some of the best meetings some of the best meetings that you have some of the best interactions you with you that you have might be in the lobby of of the hilton at ptc or yeah. it might be at the bar at the the marriott in uh, in in atlanta at, at itw so those are the that's the byproduct you know the meetings you have but it's what meetings that you have that you weren't expecting that's yeah. the value absolutely so i have a 5g question Windstream is providing a lot of connectivity. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how Windstream is, you know, collaborating with the partners about 5G? Do you see that uh, the next big thing that is going to drive uh, business forward? Um, I, I don't even know if this is actually your segment, whole stream, but I think that you have a lot of knowledge in this area. Yeah, yeah, we can talk about it. Uh, yeah, so so um, so we today provide uh, what we call fiber to the tower. We, 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 you know, uh, we have, uh, I don't know how many times, I don't know how if I can, I'll, I'll say between five and 10,000 towers. I'm going to be very generic because um, I'm not sure if we release exact, the exact numbers, but let's just say we, and, and those towers, we provide fiber to uh, the tower, really like a, a, a lit solution for the mobile operators. And we have all the mobile operators and it's been a big business for us for years, primarily in our ILAC markets, right? Uh, we do have some CLEC pieces of the business as well. Um, we primarily provide service in, I would tell you, uh, uh, tier three, tier three cities, like more of the rural markets, not so much the, the developed markets. So, you know, we're probably big in Lexington, Kentucky and Iowa and and certain parts of uh, Georgia, for example, which are I like areas versus the New York City, Chicago markets. Um, you know, five, 5G technology um, is is here for sure, for sure. Um, it, it's it's been late to the game in some of the rural or smaller markets, right? Because it's about density. Um, and I would say before this pandemic, I would tell you that I was a firm believer of uh, the 5G networks were going to overtake the broadband um, connectivity into the home. But after this, this is one thing that I've learned. I think after this, the broadband connection connectivity into the home is as valuable as it's ever been, truly. And, and I don't think any 5G network could displace what, what you can do now. I mean, I have 400 gig coming in, 400 meg coming into my house right now. Um, and it is fast and I have 30 devices, everything from my lawn sprinklers now to my, my air conditioning unit, to my garage, to all the different things that the kids are watching and using in the games. 
so so I, I think broadband is not going away into the home. I think 5G is here, certainly. It's a little later to some of those rural markets like the ones we serve in. I would tell you uh, from what we see, it's very difficult to make the model work for a service provider unless you really get aggressive with some of your assumptions. Um, you know, a standard tower will look at five to seven years out. I think some of those um, 5G networks and some of the companies like Crown and some of the fiber, the other companies, they look at the models 20 years out. So they have a bit of an advantage just the way they look at it versus a service provider because we're looking for a rate of return over a period of time. Theirs is much further out. But it's it's here. It's coming. It's going to the to the tier three markets. We dabble in it right now. We've we've constantly been on things, but it's very difficult for us to compete with it. So we kind of stay to our tower business. I understand. I just received a good question, so I want to relay that to you. Um, so you guys recently have done a very good test: seven hundred thirty kilometers, uh, eight hundred gigi on a single wave yeah. link, San Diego to Phoenix. Um, yep. is, this, is this going to be a product available na nationwide? Is there a specific areas that you have this? Uh, what, what are some of the, the things you can share about this? Yeah. With us? So, so we just did this, uh, was it uh, about a week ago? Um, so let me take you a step back to what we did before that and I'll kind of lead up to the 800 gig. So, so we tested in the lab 400 gig connectivity, which is basically more of a customer facing type service. Uh, 400 gig. When you think about 800 gig, it's more internal network. 400 gig is more something more like I would look at that as the next, you know, you went from 10 gig to 100 gig. I think the next phase of that will be 400 gig. I don't think 800 gig is probably, you know, maybe 2021, but 400 gig. I want to talk about that for a second that we've tested in the lab six months ago. And we talked about potentially offering some customers with uh, uh, 400 gig capability because we, we took it out of the lab and we were ready for work with Infinera. Um, and we have a customer right now that we're in the process of deploying 400 gig technology uh, um, between them, between us and them right now. So it's really like a wave that we're going to be selling them 400 gig. We're going to do a test. We're going to do a trial. I call it a test, not a trial. Um, that's, un that's underway right now. And I hope to have, we hope to have that concluded, uh, some point maybe at the end of July. So that's going to be that's going to be a big test because that's a customer that's using it. Now the 800 gig which 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 uh, you probably saw a little blurb from either Buddy who's our chief network officer or Art Nichols uh, who is uh, one of our technical guys that is so excited to talk about this which is great uh, because it is it's you know we're we've become that we've become a um, a leader in technology over the last I would say six months to a year where where we were a little late to the game a few years ago, building out the network level threes, they were already built out. I think we've come into the in, into the marketplace as really the technology leader because we're building very good partnerships with customers. And there's a little bit of a void in the market. Everyone's got their own thing that they're focused on. And from a wholesale perspective, from a network perspective, I could tell you my team is very focused on building the partnerships investing in whatever we need to invest in to, to, to give diversity the right routes and to really being that, that flexible business partner that enables the customers to achieve what they want to do, but at the same time developing a service partner in Windstream. So, um, but I'm glad you asked that, que that, that question. Came that, because that's an exciting, the 800 gig is an exciting thing as, a, as for us because now we're the leader in technology that in that question, market. That question came through a friend from Seattle who doesn't want to <laughs> announce his name, but is watching us. So thank you. So, so let him know that's more of an internal okay. network, but, but the, we're jazzed up about that because it's the, we're the first to do it. And it was a live, it's a test. So it's in there now. It's just not something that you can offer right now in the marketplace. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. If you have more questions, questions feel free to take that was a great me. question though I, I, I wish i would have let in with that yeah that I'm, I'm actually i'm actually receiving like text messages as questions guys you need to go to youtube i know some of you don't want to disclose the company you're working for but okay you those can send me text messages yeah. so i have a i i am one of the big fans of transparency you know that that's why i built infrapedia i mean you know winstream was most likely the first or second company. First company was Seaborn. I need to give Seaborn team a big kudos for being the first guys there, but you were the first terrestrial network to be in Infrapedia from day one. You guys also publish this map on your website. 
Tell me a little bit about transparency, about these fiber routes and having this data available, letting people to build more stronger networks. What what do you what what is your stake on this one? Uh, you want to talk about the, the the dark fiber we have or the lit systems that we have in place, the lit services? And, and you guys are very transparent with this. In your website, you can go and select multiple options. But, but yeah. my, my question is more, we should definitely talk about dark fiber because I think you are the largest carrier right now that I know of in U U.S. that sells dark fiber. And I don't know, you know, if, if ever... There, there might be some metro Zayo is selling, but not not the way that I guess you guys are doing. So that should definitely we should touch base on that and Eliume. But I want to first ask you about um, infrapedia and transparency of the fiber routes. What kind of benefits or you know disadvantages, if any, that you see for being transparent? I I, I think it's all the benefits in the world. I mean, for us, I mean, you know, for us for, to promote what we've built. So I, I can tell you, so this group, I started Windstream, seems like a long time ago, but probably seven seven years ago, give or take. And when I first joined here, we didn't have this, this network that we have today. And, you know, we had a network and I remember we sold our first 100 gig wave. It was a big thing, right? Now we sell a lot of them each month. But, but the transparency piece of the business is really important. Not only, you know, you talk about, you're talking kind of on the front end, but also on the back end when you have problems. The transparency is you have to be transparent with customers and you have to learn from it and move on. But I guess from what you're talking about is making sure custom companies that have network needs or companies that want to learn about a network is delivering that visibility to them in some sort of automated system so that they can point and click on what it is that they want, what they can buy from someone like a Windstream, and, and, you know, we have we have an online portal uh, that I think is great. And I know we we tap into some systems and allow customers to kind of tap into our systems that basically give everything that you uh, could possibly want from a building list to, um, you know, a data center that went to uh, and the speeds and the services that you're looking to sell uh, that you're looking to potentially buy. You can do that all through Windstream online right now. Um, you can point click and get a price and you can uh, you can actually order a circuit through our carrier portal, which is great. That's fantastic. Let's talk about dark fiber, uh, alien waves. Internet is growing and internet is growing exponentially. Uh, ordering one gigi, 10 gigi, you know, even in some cases, 100 gigi is not enough. You know, some some parts of, yeah. the, you know, with the big storage and backup, you know, people need larger capacity. And I think Windstream is providing uh, many alternatives to this. Uh, but what is what is some, some of the things that you can share with us about the dark fiber services, alien waves? What I mean by alien waves is, you know, as you know, it's like spectrums and things like that. Yeah. So let, let's talk about the dark fiber piece for, for a bit, and then I'll tap into the into the what you call the alien waves or spectrum. So the dark fiber, it, it, you know, going back, you know, windstreams we have, and, and I please appreciate the compliment of one of the the largest. I don't know if we're the largest, but we 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 have a hundred and I think it's a hundred and sixty thousand miles of route uh, of of route miles fiber right now in the network. So, you know, when you take a look at the pecking order, you know, you have your AT&T, Verizon, and, uh, you know, they're big, you know, and you have CenturyLink, and, you know, we probably right there for number four, number five, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, fiber route miles across the U.S. Um, we started selling it as a product versus swapping it and things probably only a few years ago, two or three years ago, uh, to the point where, you know, now it's a big piece of what we do. Um, now that's going to change a little bit because we've sold a lot of that fiber to Unity, so a lot of our CLEC assets that were not was not part of what we call the REIT, uh, the Unity REIT are now going to be you know when this transaction um, when we emerge probably like I said in August, a lot of that fiber is going to transfer over, but we'll retain some of the fiber to to, to use and sell, uh, which is basically the same network. Um, but but dark fiber is a big piece of what we do. Um, so when we look to build something. We buy fiber, but we also look to sell it. We look to sell it across, uh, you know, we look to sell it to a lot of different customers to fill a need. Now, we don't always have the route that everyone wants, right? Because we have what we have, right? But, uh, you know, the, for the routes that we have, we have a, a really tight process right now uh, to, to, to provide, you know, not only a quote and technical specs, but also to get it turned up. You know, we, we, we have uh, something that we're doing from one of the cable operators right now that needs a, a pair of fibers. We'll turn it up for them in a month, right? So that's quick. That's really quick. I'll, I'll hand them off a pair of fibers in a month, and that's that's just one of those things where we're we're we're, we're demonstrating to them they have a need. And we're going to try to help them in, with the need. Um, as it relates, so that's dark fiber. As it relates to spectrum, 
I think if you ask 10 people about Spectrum, you'll probably get 10 different answers. That's my, <laughs> that's, that's the way I look at it. We've been talking to, uh, and I remember when, when you were, where you were, I won't mention the name, we talked about Spectrum at one point as well. A, a lot of it comes down to, you know, who's, who's going to manage the equipment, who's going to own the equipment. Um, you know, a lot of what you see right now in some of these marketplaces, it's, it's, it's not really controllable, right? Because you're basically pulling pieces of light off the equipment and you're kind of handing it to someone, but someone owns the equipment. So, it, it, so we've looked at it. We've, we've, we've tinkered with it with customers. We haven't, but I would say sold anything and as it relates to spectrum. I, at some point thought it was might be the next wave, not no pun intended after the waves, um, you know, and I would say this, right. Uh, you know, we have, we've, we've right now, we're in the process of upgrading our entire network to the Infinera flex grid. When that's done, we can provide pretty much spectrum services throughout our network. Right now, you have the older pieces of the network that don't have the flex grid, Infinera flex grid capability. Um, so the older pieces of the network are not necessarily spectrum capable. And I'm sure this is this case for every all, all nationwide carriers that have these networks. Um, but the newer sections of the network, stuff that's probably 24, 36 months old, they all have capability to offer spectrum. But we it, we, we don't have it productized. Um, we've, like I said, we've, we've talked to probably five customers about it over the last few years and it just didn't work out. And there was a better solution, either dark or lit was just a better solution. That's kind of what we did. Yeah. And I, I agree with you when, you know, from a buyer side also, that was one of my concerns about, you know, will this become a, a big issue? And I have had, you know, several, several locations around the world where I am buying similar services and I had, you know, big issues you know who owns what and you know who owns who it's not about who owns what but what happens when you do get this corner case and it seems like everything is suddenly corner case because both sides don't know what to do because yeah. of lack of ownership i am getting on more questions if you want a couple more minutes do you have joe sure continue all right so um any plans on going on international mexico or europe so we received this question for you all right. So let me go with the easy one first. So we are international. Let me say that. So we have um, we have a route that goes actually we have fiber that goes uh, from the state of New York up into Montreal. So we have we are international it goes up to Canada. And we did. So we offer dark fiber up there. And we also offer lit services, you know, wave pretty much waves and Ethernet um, up to Montreal um, it, for the rest of the world. Uh, you mentioned Mexico and and um, and and uh, was it Europe as well? Europe, Europe. Talk about Mexico. Yeah. So Mexico. Uh, so let's talk about international. So we have we started our international group probably four maybe four years ago, and it's run by Mike Crimmins. I think you know Mike. Um, Mike does a great job. We have uh, I don't know how many customers, but we have now I'm going to say 50 to 100 international companies buying our services. Wholesale customers, right? Might not seem like a lot, but when you start you know, clicking the box on the major international carriers, it's a good number. And, and we had none three or four years ago. So and their interest in us is real simple. They're looking for court transport like waves and they're looking for access. You know, um, you know, in some, some cases it could be broadband, some cases it could be ethernet, some cases it could just be type two. So we have, we, the international front, we've, we've, we have a lot of the partners down in Mexico, I would say, and we, we have connectivity. We did a really, a nice job, I think, over the last three years getting into McAllen, uh, El Paso, and what's the last uh, thinking? Uh, the three major border crossings down there. So we have a lot of traffic going in and out. That and we we have access and good partners down there that we have um, that that you can connect to in those data centers. Mm -hmm. So Mexico, you know, I would say Mexico, we do it, but we do it via partners. Yeah. Same thing with international. We have um, with with Europe right now. I don't have any transatlantic capacity. We've had some discussions with some of the part, some of the, the the owners of those systems that are coming up. Any next question? Any subsidy? Okay. You know, one of the things that I think people, I'm I'm actually getting this in a, again text message, but it's interesting because people like to have their services bundled with subsea segment and you know both yeah. Atlantic Pacific. Are there any plans for Windstream to be a capacity owner in any out any markets? Oh. You can share. Yeah, so right now there's some discussions. Oddly enough, it is Spectrum. We're looking to potentially partner with someone, um, potentially offer us some transatlantic Spectrum. Um, and I, that's a project that's on the table. We haven't signed off on anything. But right now what we're doing is we're just partnering. So, you know, for transatlantic, I can use Aquacom, right? So if I have a solution that goes from, and I don't want to just resell the wet portion, that wet portion has to go someplace on my network. 
Absolutely. Right. So if he's so if Aquacoms is going to land at, at Gill and NJFX or if he's going to land at uh, New York City, wherever he's going to land, I want to be able to take it to Chicago or Florida or wherever, you know, to, to, to have some some of my network on it. And we do that today. We do that down in ne- Mexico. and We do it down in Europe. I have some international carries built into my systems today. Well, I mentioned Aquacom. Um, we have, uh, I don't know, I, mean, I have a whole list I can even, I can, I can publish it for you of all the service providers that can get me, get you, get, get any one of our customers, bundle them. they bundle it. Yeah. But it has to be a component that hits our network and then we'll type to it on them. And it's in my system and it's automated. Perfect. And, uh, last question. Thanks again. Um, any unique grounds mainstream is working on in terrestrial segment that is, uh, that you can share that is yeah. so, the building phase. Yeah, so there's a couple that we're doing right now um, that are in the works. You, you, you mentioned Seaborn, so we just, and this is more of a data center build, but we're doing some more than this. We built into that Secaucus site uh, as part of the Seaborn. Um, we were doing some, some, they needed some connectivity, so we built into that Secaucus site. We're in the process of, 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 of expanding our network uh, further into the, the, to the Northwest. I think way back when, you know, you probably remember we built out the West Coast. There's some components that we still weren't in, which was Seattle and Portland. Um, both of those cities were in the process of connecting that to the network right now. Uh, when that's said and done, we'll probably there's a little component that we're working on right now between um, L.A. and Vegas. And there's a, also a segment that we're building between Tulsa and um uh, I should say Richardson, Texas and Tulsa. I think that's where it's going. So so those are some areas. And then the other part that I mentioned um, that we probably could have a whole nother, you know, conversation about is Hillsborough. So we're oh, doing, yeah. we have a lot, a lot of activity in and around Hillsborough. You'll hear a lot of a lot of windstream stories in and out of Hillsborough over the coming probably over the next year. Right now, we're, we're just finishing up some partnerships, but we have a great asset out there. We have a um, um, eight conduits that that and, and a very, very unique asset. Uh, and fiber that rings around the whole Portland, uh, the Portland area. So that's a very valuable asset that we're now looking to connect up to the rest of the part of the network. So, so Northwest, West Coast, Richardson. There's still there's probably about five or six projects. And if you keep an eye on the the, the trade regs and some of the news wires, you'll see uh, you'll see some of those announcements coming up. Perfect, Joe. I want to thank you one more time for being not only a great uh, person to interview, uh, great questions. I'm um, great questions from our. Uh, you know, attendance, but also great answers. I, I appreciate it. Any final comments? No, I appreciate you have, having me on. Um, it's always great to talk. I, I love talking about the business, uh, you know, and, and that's going back to the conferences. You know, when you get people, and I've been doing this now probably close to 30 years, people love to talk about the business. They like to talk about the, what they're doing, what the industry's doing, just like you. You're, you're embarking upon a new business. I'm sure you you go to bed at night and you're thinking about it, right? When you wake up in the morning, you're thinking about it. And I don't get tired of it. And that's the thing. Um, there's some people that get tired of it. I don't. So I appreciate you inviting me. I appreciate you, you know, uh, allow me to, to kind of talk about what we're doing. Um, we're always looking to do more with, with anyone. Uh, we're looking for partnerships. Um, when we're looking to evolve, like I said, you know, when you think about Windstream historically, um, you know, we were, we were kind of a little late to the game. We probably focused on price a little bit more than others to kind of get in, but we're in most of the big companies in, in, in throughout the world. And at this point we've become a, a critical business partner. We're flexible. Um, and when we emerge from bankruptcy here in the next you know couple of months, we're, we're going to have a really good balance sheet. Um, and I would tell you that, that I would, I would say look out for Windstream because we're going to, you know, we're going to evolve into that, into that, into that player that's now going to be the leader in technology, which is in the past probably focused on price and getting in the door. We're in the door and we have the partnerships. Now we're going to lead. So. Fantastic. Thanks again. Yeah. Ladies right. and gentlemen, I want to thank Joe uh, once again for joining me. This week is really busy. I look forward to having you back in the channel, asking your questions. We are going to have uh, a lot of uh, guests and please, Subscribe, make sure that uh, you hit that button so that you can get notified as we go live. And thank you once again. See you tomorrow.